continued discussion on Andrew Eric Ball. I don't know how many of you folks had a chance to see the previous one. If you missed it, the video is up on the on the studio website, studiohpdc.org, so you can catch up on, on what you missed. Uh, but this is a continuation of this series. We're really diving into indoor air quality. And today we'll talk a little bit about, well, about measuring it, but also um, what Mike will talk a lot about is what to do about it, how to determine what is influencing your air quality in your house. So Mike, take it away. All right. So this is about indoor air quality, uh, things that really happen. And we've done the Zoom etiquette. I'm gonna cover very quickly what we did last time when we tried to define indoor air quality. And then a very little bit on indoor air quality related measurement devices. What you might want to monitor why CO2 is used as a proxy for indoor air quality, what we mean by that. And is it really useful? I think the answer to this may be sometimes. And I do have, a, Nick requested a takeaway. So Paul Eldrenkamp wrote a really nice, like one or two pager venting about ventilation in which he talks about uh, standards and ventilation and CO2 and a couple of examples with data that I sent. So uh, uh, Nick or Aaron, is there a way to get this to people um, after the fact? In other words, mailing them. Do you have a mailing list or? Yeah, we can email anything out to folks. Great. So we'll do that at least with this. And then we can talk about what people might be interested in next time. So what we did last time was we defined some indoor air quality parameters like relative humidity and what might be a good quote unquote range. Uh, carbon dioxide, uh, you know, well, below 1100, I think people would like, like that very much. I think uh, OSHA has a limit of 5,000, which seems crazy high, uh, but um, I don't know why. Uh, it's probably way too high. Um, EPA for carbon monoxide has about 50 ppm parts per million. Volatile organic compounds, because they have such a wide range and what exactly each volatile organic compound might do and which concentration to you really depends. For example, our perfumes are powerful VOCs, and they sent my butterfly VOC detector off the chart when we were on Amtrak going to New York City. But perfume isn't necessarily a problem. We don't know that it isn't, but we don't think it is. Um, ozone is another problem, uh, particularly with attempts by people to improve their indoor air quality by creating ozone generators. Yes, ozone will combine with things and take them out of the air. It also does nasty things to people. It's in respiratory tract irritant, and it also dissolves rubber. So if you want all the rubber in your house to dissolve, uh, that might be something you could try. Um, radon, right now we have a limit of four picocuries per liter of air by the EPA, that's for homes, I think. And particulates, that's kind of a, a, an interesting um, and not totally well-defined area, although we do have the air quality index, which is calculated on particulates. We'll get into that a little bit later. Mold, again, it, a lot depends on whether what kind of mold it is and what the concentration is, but viruses, we certainly have heard about that. And that's a big question mark. I don't know that anybody is really measuring, or at least I haven't heard of anyone measuring concentrations of viruses in the air. That would be an interesting piece of equipment. I imagine not, not inexpensive. Uh, lead in the air. Uh, while we have successfully eliminated um, lead from most automobile gasolines, I believe it's still used in aviation gasoline to raise the octane. So there's still some of that around. Uh, sulfur dioxide, another byproduct of conduction, combustion, and nitrous uh, or nitrogen dioxide. And then where does where do these sources come from? Combustion appliances, tobacco, building materials and furnishing, uh, deteriorated asbestos insulation and old heating plants. Asbestos used to be used for insulation on steam pipes and so forth. Newly installed flooring, particularly that of the composite variety. Uh, upholstery, carpet, things that have uh, formaldehyde and or other volatile organics in them. Uh, cabinetry or furniture, again, that press board. Um, pressed wood products, 
household cleaning materials, uh, not, not, those have not necessarily been vetted for safety. Uh, they have warning labels used in a well-ventilated area. That sort of takes the legal liability away from them and puts it on you. Uh, personal care products, hobby products, um, central air and cooling and dehumidification systems. So certainly cooling systems can accumulate mold. Humidification systems put moisture in the air, probably not a good idea. Uh, in most cases, it's better to stop the air infiltration that is probably causing the low humidity in your house, but adding humidity, adding moisture to the house can cause problems with it going up to the roof sheathing and collecting there and, and creating a potential mold situation up there also. Um, excess moisture of any kind, uh, the EPA has an indoor air quality plus checklist and many of the checklist items are bulk water management outside your house. Uh, this is because bulk water management, for example, not flashing a window properly can cause water to enter the house and that can cause problems with decay and mold and other things like that. Uh, below grade, the same sort of thing. If you haven't properly damp proofed your foundation, created a capillary break between the foundation and the footing, uh, that, that can be a problem. Indoor air quality plus checklist is really good for a lot of reasons like that. And outdoor air sources, we have radon coming in. Uh, pesticides, particularly those put against the foundations uh, for termite proofing and that sort of thing. And th the various sources of outdoor air pollution because all of the air we breathe in our houses comes from outdoors somehow, some way. So that was what we did last time. Any questions on any of that? Any comments, thoughts? Hearing none, I'll continue on. So when I think about ventilating buildings and we're all making tighter buildings now, so ventilation is becoming more important than it used to be. Um, I think of two categories. I think of point source. Uh, we ventilate to remove concentrated moisture and odors. And two prime areas for that is the kitchen cooktop odors and the obvious um, moisture and in bathrooms, you know, large moisture loads there from showers and potentially odors. And then what I call hygienic air exchange, meaning um, of a general distributed nature, not point source, they're not concentrated. So we're talking about generally the living spaces in the house and in particular bedrooms, because they're small rooms, we tend to close the doors. And I'll show you why we develop carbon di dioxide concentrations there. Um, we'd like to replace the stale air uh, with fresh clean air. And so that's what hygienic air exchange is about. Frequently we design ventilation systems with extraction from at least the bathrooms and possibly from the kitchen. So getting some of those point source um, pollutants extracted and we distribute air into the bedroom uh, using a heat exchanger, this all works out really well because it's balanced. The equal amount of air being extracted from kitchen and plus bathrooms equals the um, clean air we're putting into bedrooms and general living spaces. So we gradually dilute the uh, general indoor pollutants. But we shouldn't depend on hygienic air exchange to control point source pollution. Um, it's really best to capture that moisture and odors when it's concentrated because we really want to get it out of the building before it goes throughout the building. Think of cooking some really odiferous um, fish or something like that. If you let that get into your house, even a really good hygienic air exchange system is going to take a long time to clear that odor out. Whereas if that cooktop stuff is captured while it is concentrated and ejected from the building. Um, this is another good reason why a kitchen cooktop hood should go to outside rather than through a grease, uh, maybe even charcoal filter. Uh, there are things that that filter may not capture. There are things that, that, that not cleaning that filter uh, may cause it not to re be removed from the air. So, so it's really a good idea to, to eject to the outside cook, kitchen cooktop effluent. Uh, the passive house community 
has traditionally not done that, but um, well, when I went to see Dr. Feist's unit in the very first passive house that was created, I asked him that question. He said, oh yeah, look, we just run into the HRV. And so this is the kitchen, kitchen cooktop exhaust right over the cooktop. And he said, we just run that into the HRV. And I was astounded. I said, what about cooking grease and things like that? He said, nah, not a problem. We just uh, have these cheap filters. And he took out the filter and showed it to me. We throw it in the dishwasher. We run the dishwasher, pop it back in after it's dry. No problem. And in fact, I was there the year that they were celebrating, I think, the 25th anniversary of the first passive house. So they had done a teardown of the HRV. And lo and behold, there was no significant damage to it, at least that, that's what they told us. So that scheme actually worked. But I don't know of anybody in the US with the courage to do that. So um, an interesting possibility. And what I'm going to do next is look at this hygienic air exchange in the bedroom more closely to kind of show you something about hygienic air exchange standards. So the reason we use carbon dioxide is that there is this carbon cycle thing going on. And plants and trees are a big part of this. So when we exhale carbon dioxide, it's a tiny amount. When we burn fossil fuels, it's a lot more. But let's just talk about the carbon dioxide we exhale. So it goes to a tree and with sunlight and water, it, it photosynthesis happens and it creates oxygen and we get that oxygen back. So if this is all in balance, uh, then it's fine. But when we put people in buildings, we don't have trees inside. So we've got to do something to manage that carbon dioxide concentration. And that's the hygienic air exchange I'm talking about. So this is the second floor of my house. And uh, re recall where bedroom three is, Mike's office. That will be in part two. But this is the second floor. We've got you know typical four bedrooms. And uh, bedroom two is located here. And that is where we are going to put our carbon dioxide data logger. And we're going to show you what that is logging. And then this is the door that's going to close. So when I say the bedroom door is closed, it's this bedroom door and just that bedroom door. All the other doors are open, including the one to the hall bath where there is a bath fan. And this bath fan is going to be using exhaust ventilation uh, for the whole house, which means it's gonna run continuously simulating a building code legal, but not very effective method of hygienic air exchange. So this is a graph of the carbon dioxide in that bedroom too. The house is not very tight. I worked as much as I could with the surfaces I had access to during the renovation, and we got it down to five air changes an hour. So this is still two air changes an hour worse than building code uh, maximum air exchange, and a lot worse, like an order of magnitude worse than passive house type levels of air tightness. So when we talk about carbon dioxide building up in houses, that are passive house airtight, it certainly is worse than this, but we are seeing significant amounts of carbon dioxide buildup in this house that is not very airtight at all by today's standards. So the first thing that happens is at 11.15, I go into the bedroom and I close the door and we can see the carbon dioxide starting to increase. And then at 1.30 a.m., I turn on that bath fan that fan in the hall bath across the hall, leaving the hall bath fan, uh, the hall bath door open, but the bedroom door closed. And so that fan, I've measured it 88 CFM. So it's much greater than the 62 CFM required by ASHRAE 622 to 2010. But you can see the carbon dioxide level continues to increase. I turn the exhaust fan off at 6 a.m. That's there and it continues to increase in the bedroom. And so the bedroom door is open at 6.30. So what we're seeing here is a cold, code legal, old ASHRAE standard ventilation rate using the exhaust bath fan. And we're not seeing it doing a very good job of controlling carbon dioxide. So I just throw a question out there. Why do you think this is the case? 
uh, it is after all an ASHRAE standard, American Society for Heating and Refrigeration Engineers. Anybody have any comments or thoughts or questions that they wanna drop in the chat or speak out? All right, then we'll continue on. So, oh, Mike, um, Brendan Kavanaugh posted a comment. He said, I'm assuming there's no forced air system, yes? That's correct. This is a hydronically heated home. But <laughs> it doesn't even matter because we have times where we're not, not like heating the house and the windows are closed. Uh, so uh, there's that to consider. In fact, uh, this, this is kind of gets worse uh, in the shoulder seasons. If the house is this leaky, then if we have a big temperature differential, we're gonna have a higher air exchange rate than in the shoulder seasons when it's, it's not so much because stack effect never produces air change natural. Air change natural, that, that mythical figure is an average over months of time. So it, it's sort of like, depending on natural ventilation, so-called natural ventilation, where you're just depending on the leakage rate, that air leakage rate is driven by a temperature difference indoor to outdoors, right? So that's never constant. It's always changing, even within the day. So the amount of ventilation your house gets that way, it changes every single day, multiple times. And so it's not a very good way to assure a consistent level of ventilation, which I, I will show you later um, is important. So that was that was a good question. Any other questions? Mike, can you go back to the previous slide? This is sure. This yes, this one. So this is how many cubic feet of air is in that space? Um, in the bedroom space. Bedroom two. Yeah, bedroom two where the logger is. Oh, I don't know. It's like a 10 by 12 or something like that. Have you run your dilution calculator on that space? Um, I have not uh, because it has no ventilation. Hmm. And the reason, well, okay. Well, let me, let me let you think about that and ask more questions if you like. No, it has no mechanical ventilation. Let me say that. Okay, and have you made any changes since then, or is this just? No, this is the real deal. This is the way most houses work, by the way. <laughs> yeah, it's an ASHRAE standard. It must be. It must be the right thing to do, right? So, one of the things is, and this is in Paul's uh, venting about ventilation paper, right? He he sort of uh, pokes a little fun at these standards that don't rely on on measured data or or because standards are committees, hmm, do you think that there might be a compromise somewhere? I, I did have an occasion to uh, speak with someone on the ASHRAE Standards Committee about this, because I did this measurement a long time ago and, and I, I, I noticed he was on 62.2, so I said, hey, you know, what about this? I did this measurement and then I started thinking about the problem, right? And then I took my manometer and I put my manometer underneath that closed door. And I said, well, what's the, what's the pressure difference? Air moves as a result of a difference in pressure, right? That, that's why air moves. It doesn't move because of arrows on a diagram or anything like that. And so what did I measure with this manometer? Maybe 0.1 Pascal, okay? And so there's this half inch un undercut on my door I've got half of a well, tenth of a Pascal uh, of air pressure across it. It was moving nada air. So the only way that this exhaust fan could, could work is in, in this situation is it would have to create a significant pressure difference across that door enough to pull air through that bedroom window into the, the bedroom, right? That's, that's the theory, I mean, as near as I can figure, as near as I can figure, the theory of using this hall bath fan, this exhaust fan, bath fan to actually keep air fresh in a bedroom is that it would have to create enough of a pressure difference across that door 
and, and you would have to rely on the leakiness of the window for outside air to leak into the bedroom. And that would be caused by a pressure difference uh, across the door, right? I mean, can anybody else think of any other way that ASHRAE 62.2 could work in a house with a VAT fan for exhaust ventilation? So, so that theory is all fine and dandy, except it doesn't work. When you turn that bath fan on, guess what? All the other doors in the house are open. The air comes from you know, the first floor up the stairway. It comes from everywhere except through bedroom two. So when you like close the door on these bedrooms, there's no driving force to move air in and out of them. So the CO2 content goes up. Does that, not, that does all make sense? Any questions on that? And this is like the default ventilation rate for most of the houses being built today. I mean, people are starting to get toward balanced mechanical ventilation where you're actually introducing air into bedrooms. But there are quite a few houses in which what they're doing is they're just putting in an AR, e, HRV or ERV someplace and they're just dumping air in the hallway. Or, or, you know, there's only one place the air goes into the building and one place it goes out of the building leaving the bedrooms unaddressed. So that's the unfortunate reality. Any other questions or thoughts on this? Have you installed the ventilation system, Mike, since then? No. You know why? <laughs> because I've got an, a CO2 monitor on my desk. And I started looking at this and I thought, oh, this is ugly. Uh, so what I've taken to doing is leaving my uh, Mike's office bedroom door open all the time, because if I don't, the CO2 content goes up and around 1500 or so, maybe two or three hours after I'm in here, I feel to get a little drowsy or anything. I look at the monitor and I think, oh, okay. So then I'll open the bedroom door. And, and I was closing the bedroom door in the wintertime because I was using a little electric heater. But since I got my air source heat pump, yeah, a 9,000 BTU heat pump heats my house most of the year. It is a 38,000 BTU an hour design load. But that's another story, right? So I keep my bedroom door open now because I'm using that as my heating system because I've turned my oil boiler off. I have to figure out how much oil I used last year, but certainly um, in, in the tens of gallons, you know, the few tens of gallons. So yeah, this problem exists. Now, some people will put ventilation air into ductwork. They have a uh, heating cooling system that's ducted and that works except when the fan isn't running. So if you try to put the fan on all the time, that's a huge electrical load, right? So now what do you do? I've talked this over with other people and I had my quality assurance guy for my, um, PERS Raider certification, my certification, quality assurance certification every year. I've talked to him about it. He says, yeah, I don't see how that can work either because it's not always running. So without dedicated ducted distribution system to the bedrooms, it's really, it's hit or miss on air, indoor air quality. And when you actually monitor this, you can see it. That all makes sense. Any other questions or thoughts? Could I jump in here with a question? This is Brendan. Please, Brendan. Hey, Mike. Um, yeah, I just, I've been thinking about this a lot recently and um, it, I found the conversation with clients or in our case, you know, homeowners uh, difficult because um, things like a forced air system or openings of doors and windows, you know, essentially cheaper solutions than a dedicated balanced ventilator will combat this CO2 buildup in bedrooms or in small rooms, small occupied rooms. Um, you know, of course it won't uh, bring in fresh outdoor air, maybe not get to your like defined hygienic ventilated standard, but they are, you know, much more um, feasible solutions, whether they'll be executed properly is another question. Uh, just, just a thought. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, it seems over here, it's more about money than quality and, over in Europe, they have a some some people, many certainly, you know, the Pasadena community has got this um, this balance. I think figured out better. Um, so yeah, that's an interesting comment. Thank you for making it. So anyone else? All right, we'll move on. 
Uh, so we did this. Uh, Mike, there was a comment in the chat just more yeah. about, um, say, putting a, a, you know, a vent over the door into the hallway. Would that, would that change the situation or would that? If would there is a driving force, yeah, there has to be a pressure difference, right? So it, the air is going to take the path of least resistance. And if it's coming up the stairs, it's going to be coming up the stairs and going into the bathroom exhaust fan, right? Not through the bedroom with the door closed. And our solution to this is because my wife and I live here and that, that's it. We just leave the bedroom doors open and we're good. And in fact, we need to do that because as I said, we're heating the whole house over the winter most of the time. That is to say, when it's above about 17 degrees Fahrenheit, all the heat in the house is coming from a ductless mini split that's under in the room below bedroom four. But th that's, that's for another time. That, that's another, I've got some interesting things to show with that. Um, not, not necessarily to a, a level of comfort everyone would find acceptable, but it's working. And I'm going to put an air source heat pump upstairs. Yes, absolutely. But just started out this way to see what was possible. And I was surprised. So uh, we've got this down. And when people are awake, you've seen this chart, right? So uh, down across the bottom here, white is 600 ppm, blue is 1,000 ppm, black is 2,500 ppm. And this is a really nice graphic uh, done of a study. Uh, I think it was done at United Technologies. There were a lot of engineers there. They work on aircraft. And they had good air quality days and moderate air quality days and bad air quality days. And this is the carbon dioxide part of that. And so you can see for some categories, basic activities, uh, 600 ppm is really good. And 2,500 is really bad. And in some of the other categories, like information orientation, it didn't seem to make a whole lot of difference. Basically, they would take this test at the end of the day and see how well their brains are functioning. So uh, does CO2 content make a difference when you're awake? Yes. Uh, but in bedrooms at night, well, studies indicate anecdotally that people are like feeling more rested, but we don't have any um, actual data that I know of yet on that. So we had this idea that CO2 could be a proxy, right? Uh, rather than measuring all these variables uh, and trying to figure out what's going on, maybe we can use CO2 as a proxy and can work pretty well. Uh, we've got 400, about 400 parts per million atmospheric. Let's add a, an IAQ coefficient of 700 to that. So let's say if we can keep our indoor CO2 to 1100 parts per million or below, we'll call that kind of okay. We'll, we'll call declare success there. And uh, hygienic uh, air exchange, well, that's, this is an outtake from another one. So what does that look like? This is 1100 PPM. So clearly we're not, we're not making good indoor air quality with the stagnant air in the bedroom overnight. Here is a balanced commissioned ventilation system, one which actually has been adjusted to specifications. Very important to do that. A lot of people forget or don't do it. And you can see here's the 1100 PPM line. I'd call this success, right? We go above it for short periods of time, but hey, it, it's a compromise. This is a typical performance of a Zender system, two people, and I think it might be like 25 CFM for the two people in a small bedroom. So I, I'd call this success. Um, then again, we have, uh, this is from my local newspaper. And the fire department was looking at uh, air flows in buildings. And they decided that to stop airflow paths, decrease damage, and increase your safety, close the doors before going to bed. So remember, before you doze, close. And so you kind of have to think about all of this advice and what it's considering and, and what's important to you and, and what is, is less likely. So this is an old ASHRAE standard for ventilation. And I'd like to note in particular CFM per person. Correctional facilities, well, we don't seem to value those people very highly, including the guards. We're not going to give them a lot of air. Um, but daycare and things like that, we're a little bit more in interested in. Classrooms even, seven and a half, that kind of surprised me. That's a pretty low air exchange rate. Um, and then what I did was I took this respiration per person and the carbon dioxide emissions per person in cubic meters per hour of, of pure carbon dioxide. I took this and I made a 
dilution calculator, which Nick referred to earlier in a spreadsheet. And I said, okay, if we're bringing in about 400 ppm outside and we're using a very low ventilation rate, like let's say three or four CFM and here's five CFM and here's maybe seven and a half and 10 and maybe 18 and out here, what happens? And what happens is we get a nice quick drop, okay? So we're getting good return on investment because remember all of the CFMs we're bringing in and the heating season we're heating and the cooling season we're having to cool and dehumidify. So the more air we bring in, the more energy cost there is. And this is like 10 CFM per person, right? And that's not too bad. And well, here's something like 17 CFM per person and that's getting close to our 1100 parts per million. And, and so that's you know another thing to consider, but as you try to push well below a thousand, you have a large energy expense because you are having to change more and more air and you are never gonna get to 400. You know, you could get to a thousand CFM per person and you'll never get to 400 PPM because the outdoor air concentration of CO2 is greater than that. So there's this balance, right? How much energy do you wanna spend removing and moving the air and heating the new fresh air, even with a good heat, heat exchanger, you have to do some heating, it's not 100%. Uh, heat recovery. So this is a, you know, really an open question. And certainly when you're doing a passive house budget, you, you tend to tolerate higher CO2 than not. By the way, I don't think FIAS does this. I don't think this is part of their certification. It's, uh, they go by CFM per bedroom and whatever you do in that bedroom, you know, how many people sleep in there. And, and certainly that happens in low income multifamily housing, right? You get a lot of people in a small bedroom. So something to think about. Hey Mike, what is the, can you go back? So Mike, what is the space that you, when you built this dilution calculator, is this based on your bedroom or is this based on the classroom? Which, what is the size space that you're diluting? So I'm looking at keeping, uh, well, it, it's, it's not so much based on size as balance. This is, this is for a, a steady state, right? not people entering a room that is, is, is low CO2 concentrations. So the size really is, is not something I'm considering. This is steady state balance. But I thought when you ran this dilution calculator on the classroom, it was because we were high occupancy, low volume and airtight, mm. that's what was making it a higher CO2 dilution. That, that, I thought, the, yes. I thought if, if, we, if we were like in a big stadium and we had a 50 foot ceiling, we would have to dilute more air in order to get that same level of concentration. Well, yes, but you have to remove the same amount of CO2. So what, I, what the situation in your classroom is it doesn't take long to come to steady state because it's small. Mm -hmm. And the impact of the air that is undisturbed when people enter the, the classroom is pretty immediate because the CO2 load is large compared to the volume. I mean, you're absolutely right. The volume of the room makes a difference. But this is for steady state because then you need a dilution calculator that also takes into account another dimension. And that other dimension is the volume of the room. So Mike, could you, could you make this, I'm just trying to think, because you kind of custom made this, could you make this as a tool that people could sort of say, okay, here's what my CO2 monitor is reading. Like Aaron's got his monitor there. And if he said, okay, I wanna know roughly how much CFM I need to bring in to balance this. Could you make this tool user friendly for people who are sort of very entry level? Um, I would not use volume. You would not, it would not. I would not volume. use volume for that. Nope. I would, but, I would use steady state because everybody's got a different, you know, volume. And, and if you're, if you're talking about housing right that's one thing if you're talking about a classroom that's something else again i i, I haven't gone back to look but if i i bet if we look at the co2 plots in the classroom they are way faster than the co2 they increase way faster than the co2 concentration in my bedroom with just me in it see what i'm saying yeah, I'm just thinking it'd be interesting for people to be able to say, okay, well, like, well, wh why is my, what are my CO2 levels and what would I need to do? Like, it's interesting. I, I haven't looked at this graph before, but to see how much, how little return on, as you ramp up the, 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 um, the ventilation. ventilation I'm, I'm interested because my, my sister lives in Alaska and during the COVID outbreak, she was asking me like, 
you know, they, I was like, what do you, I asked them what they're doing for ventilation in the schools. And they're like, well, they don't really want to overventilate because it's freezing cold, right? But it's right. like, well, if you don't overventilate, you're potentially going to get sick. But it's like interesting, like, this, and, and I yeah. know with FIAS, there's, penal, there's an energy penalty and, an, and a certification penalty if you, if you overventilate. But it seems like what is the striking, what is the balance between ventilation and a healthy CO2 level? And yeah, like, that's, that's a really good question. And FIAS is not taking that on because <laughs> it's, it's a fixed ventilation rate. It's one number, right? Yeah. And because the swamp gets pretty deep when you go beyond that. So what I would say is that if you monitor CO2 with these little monitors that we have, right, you get a feeling for what's going on. And in a classroom, the response to filling that classroom to getting the steady state is faster and it's, it's asymptotic than um, a larger room. And, and I think I think I wouldn't do that for volume because it complicates the issue. I'm not sure that I'm answering that question completely, but. Yeah, I'm just trying to think if there was a way to make this a simple tool that people could use to try to. Yeah, I don't think, it. I hear what you're saying. I don't think people have the knowledge to apply something like this, quite frankly. The, the, so this is where, do you know, serve the con conditioning energy recovery ventilator? from um, the company in Ohio, uh, not Ohio, uh, Illinois, uh, trying to blanking on the name. So, so they are using yeah. demand control ventilation, yeah. which we are coming to, right? But we, and I think Zender is doing this too, right? They have a CO2 detector and they ramp up the ventilation rate when the CO2 goes up and they slow it down when it's not because we're assuming fixed rate ventilation for most houses, right? That doesn't change, right? But certainly the ventilation load changes and certainly in commercial settings like the classroom. If we ran that at a ventilation rate to hold the PPM down to like 1100 all the time, you'd have an incredible heating load. It would be crazy, crazy high. So, so you adapt manually right now. And while there is a CO2 sensor in there, I don't know, did you ever get it working correctly? No, what we found out from Zender was that the CO2 sensor, it gets overridden when it's by, by the manual. Yeah. Whenever anybody yeah. presses the bathroom boost fan, it turns off the CO2 sensor. Yeah, fantastic, right? So we are nowhere near the control sophistication necessary to do demand control generation, except for the serve. Um, Build Equinox, that's the name of the company, right? Build Equinox is, is a popular with Passive House Aficionados um, uh, ventilation company. So I'm going to move on, uh, but we can definitely talk about this some more later or in a succeeding session. Let's talk about other things. Uh, let's talk about particulates. So this is the IQ Air device. I learned about this from Fred Gordon, and it's a really interesting device. It measures temperature, relative humidity, carbon dioxide, and particulates in micrograms per cubic centimeter, and it is networked. And as you can see, it has an indoor component and it's networked so it can show you someplace else. So here is the one in my home office. And on this particular day, uh, we had not too bad CO2 and we had an indoor air quality uh, index of eight and a very low two micrograms per cubic meter. Whereas in North Chelmsford, and why North Chelmsford? Because as one of these air visual machines in North Chelmsford and someone has said, share my data. So that was the closest one to me. And, uh, I, and just for comparison, that's, that's what's going on in the outdoors. And so you see here, we have carbon dioxide here. We have two micrograms per cubic meter here and an indoor air quality coefficient of eight. And we have here, this green and the green is a color coding of the air quality. And you can see it's like pretty good. You know, sometimes it's really good and sometimes a little bit of microparticulates, but okay. And here in this house, it's not, not quite as good. So here's their icons. This is color coded, user-friendly. Look at the color and see what it is. So good is green, moderate is yellow, um, orange is, uh, unhealthy for sensitive groups like uh, people with asthma and that sort of thing. Then there's red unhealthy, harmful for sensitive, sensitive groups, 
uh, reduced out outdoor activity for everyone, very unhealthy. Everybody is, you know, avoid this, this is bad. And then hazardous, like really, it's seriously bad in here, right? So that's their color coding. And this is using EPA's air quality index. I'm not going to go into that right now. So let's look at some more data. So here's this air visual machine. And you can see, well, we get about 730 ppm for our, um, for our carbon dioxide. Um, and we've got about two, two uh, micrograms per cubic meter. But look at what happened yesterday. Yesterday, we get some red, you know, and it gradually decays down into green. And in this house, you know, someplace in North Chelmsford, it's low. So I said, oh, well, that's interesting. And I've got this in my little office, right? I'm thinking, oh, that's interesting. Uh, and this graph is really kind of visually interesting because it kind of tells you what goes on. You can see something happened and then it decayed, you know? And here, oh, we've got pretty good indoor air quality now, at least by the CO2 metric, but, um, We've got some really bad indoor air quality in the house, right? I mean, this is seriously bad stuff going on. Uh, and, you know, CO2 looks okay. This isn't too bad right now. This is the current, current one. But, but last night, it wasn't too good. It was pretty bad. And here is, you know, <laughs> some seriously bad indoor air quality right now. And the CO2 is great. So we can see that while CO2 can be used as a proxy, it's a proxy for what I'd call steady state conditions, meaning that if you have some stuff in your house that's off-gassing and your ventilation at a constant rate and the ventilation is taking care of that, then that might be okay. But something's going on in this building, right? We're getting some pretty high microparticulates here, right? And so why is that happening? So how do we figure this out? This is the kind of guided discovery portion of this. Um, you ask me questions. We only got about 10 minutes left, but like ask me questions and I will try to answer them and, and see if we can figure out what was going on because I got this air, indoor air quality monitor. I put it in my room. I look and it's green today, and then I see these other things going on. I'm thinking, my God, what's happening? Did I vacuum? Because a vacuum cleaner without a helper filter, that would put a lot of particulates in the, uh, in the air. Um, carpets, I've got wall-to-wall -wall carpet. Would walking around in here a lot do that? Um, so what do you think? Well, I know in my house, when I, when I cook, that's when it goes up. So yes. was there any cooking going on at this time? Yes. Yeah. That, and, and you know that only because you were monitoring it, right? <laughs> exactly. Had you not said that, what would people think? And I looked around. I thought, what, what's going on? Um, I've got hydronic heating. So it's not like my air handler kicking on because it's, it's not that. So I was searching for some time. And then finally, what I wound up doing was the thing... I always wind up doing, if you don't know what's going on, just take more data. So I started taking data and I started correlating it to things that were going on. So like when, when Julia makes apple pancakes and I notice it goes up in the morning because that was a breakfast food, right? Um, and I don't have gas. I have electric and induction. This is food. Food cooking. Wow. You know, this is mind blowing, right? The food we cook, we got no gas going on. The food we cook is doing this. And you just don't know this unless you take your air quality monitor home and start looking at it. Now, why? Why does the cooking do this? I've got a perfectly good cooktop. I have measured it 600 CFM extraction. I measured it. I know it's working. And, and um, it's in a corner, right? So like there's a cabinet on one side and there's a wall in the back. So that's good because then more of the air is coming from the direction of the cook and, and a little bit from the side, but that's like sweeping 
the cooktop particulates up into the cooktop. So, so why is the cooktop hood not, not dealing with this? I mean, 600 CFM is a lot. In fact, 670 CFM it was better than 600. I got a really short run out. I've got a really low restriction um, vent cap on the outside and it's doing better than its spec. Why do you think? What's going on? I know the secret answer, but some just guess. What do you think could be happening? I'll give you one more minute. Or ask questions. I mean, I'm, I'm open like to- This is an electric range you're using? This is not a gas range? This, this is an induction range, not even a resistance range. We got it 10 years ago. Is My it, wife is wanted it, propane. Is it micro particles coming off of the food from like the- That's it. I, that's what I think. Like I find this fascinating that it's happened with the induction, but also the, the monitor for this whole time was up in your office, right? Which is a floor yes. office. Yes, yes. Hmm. So, uh, you know, sometime I talk about the, uh, how a 9,000 BTU an hour heat pump heats the upstairs and it's downstairs. In <laughs> fact, it's as far away downstairs as it could get from the stairway. It's really interesting what happens when you start looking at three-dimensional airflow in buildings. Mike, can you go back to the previous slide on what was sure. the bubbles you were getting when you were cooking? <laughs> there you go. This is so, like... So here, I have a question about this because we put this, we put this same sensor in our kitchen. Does this, so if there's like oils or things that kind of like will like, you know, cluster in the air, will they throw these sensors off? Like how much is this getting, because this is like sending a laser through the air and trying to read yeah. particle matter size. So it's I wonder measuring if the particles. Like oils that blob up in the air or tend to like, part, you know, stick to things will it well, throw the readings off the answer to that is it goes away after the event so notice how it goes it goes up and it goes down so, so the blog where blobs are you, where are you locating this in relation long term to, where are you locating this in relation to the to the cooktop it's upstairs in my home office oh really yeah yeah i mean it's going to be worse in the kitchen do you think you think the kitchen's going to be worse than that? I, I, I'm sure of it. Right? The kitchen's worse. You know what's uh, also weird that was counterintuitive? Did you see the, the session that Koto Wenyo did on uh, building science where he talks about, um, he talks about uh, moisture buoyancy and like why the moisture of the air always moves to the ridge? Yes. I'm wondering yes. if that's carrying microparticles upstairs. So if you're cooking downstairs and you're generating oh. heat, is that, is that drafting, is that pulling up all the microparticles upstairs as well? So maybe- It is absolutely stack effect. So I, well. Because I have visualized, I have made stack effect visible in my house and I have a video to prove it. So maybe- and That's like how my, my mini split is heating the upstairs. And in fact, there are two, there are two convection loops to think about, but we, we can't go into that here. But uh, just to answer your question, any other questions, any other questions about- well, why is this not working? Why are we getting this buildup? I've got there, this really good cooktop. I've measured the airflow in it. You know, you know the secret answer? I'll tell you the secret answer. Because my wife hates the noise and won't turn it on. And it's no good to do an excellent design with a cooktop if no one uses <laughs> cooktop exhaust. And this is, by the way, much more common than you think. And it is, by the way, why code now mandates that the cooktop exhaust fan turn on when you turn on the cooktop. Now, does this deal with ovens? No. Does bad stuff come out of ovens? Yes. I put the, this monitor right next to our um, kitchen counter, like right where, where, where we do the cooking so you see the levels so you remember to turn it on. Yeah, yeah. Or you could like hardwire it to the cooktop and that's another way. Um, Mike, a question in the chat. When when the hood range is used, when um, well, I is it depressurizing the kitchen, or or do you have you also have makeup air that you're using? So my wife has to be not home to do that. Let me tell you how bad this is. Okay, you know that bath fan on the second floor in the shared bath. 
If she is downstairs in the other part of the house working away and I turn that thing on, she'll come upstairs and turn it off because she hates the noise. This is the reason for the code requirement of fan. Now these are old fans, right? This, this, this renovation was done, or actually this was done more than 10 years ago. The code requires a certain maximum amount, number of zones, it might be two zones or something for a bath fan because people won't use them if they're noisy. That, that's, this is the real world, right? This isn't like theoretical calculations and all this stuff. This is what happens in, in real homes everywhere. That user behavior is so critical to this. Oh yeah. When you have to turn on the, yeah. On the yeah. Yeah, you can design all the fancy hardware you want. If people don't use it, it's worthless. It'd be interesting if somebody would actually integrate uh, a control, put a CO2 monitor, just build it right into the top of a hood vent or a stove. Yeah, well, you'd get huge. I, I think you would get clogged up really quickly. I've had my, I had my visual air clogged up once so far, and there's a procedure to unclog it. It becomes really obvious because uh, I think the CO2 goes crazy high or something. So, so something on the on the display indicates it. So when you Google, I've got this on my uh, vi air visual display. What do I do? Uh, there, you find the instructions to unclog it. And I think it's just blowing some air in it or something like that. It has a, a uh, filter, as as everything that moves air through it should. So obviously, the where this air visual, the way this air visual indoor air quality monitor works is it must pull air through itself, right? That's the way it gets the CO2 reading. That's the way it gets the microparticulate reading. That's the way all this stuff happens. So it has to pull it. So there's a little fan and then there's a filter and the filter gets clogged. Um, Mike, there's a question in the chat and it's kind of yes. related to, to what I want to say is that this is so, you know, we're talking about user behavior and coming up with ways to force the user to use range hood, but wow. there are also ways we can simply make the fans quieter. That um, That is what we must do. I, I think that is, essential because when you say the word force, when I hear people say like, we're gonna force people to use less gasoline, we're gonna force people to cut their emissions from their houses in half in the next 10 years, or, or it's not gonna happen. Force is not in American vocabulary. We're a democracy, that ain't gonna happen. You have to make them want to, right? Like Nick was suggesting, let's put a monitor in there and give them some feedback that bad things are happening to them. And yes, absolutely, there is a way to put a remote fan, right? Don't build it into the cooktop hood, put that fan remotely so it is quiet, right? So they actually use it. And then there's, there's the other crazy things too, like not measuring the cooktop. There was one six burner wolf stove. We went in um, and, and we measured, the, I measured the flow of the duct blaster. And over that six burner wolf stove, this thing sounded like a 747 taken off. I'm sure it was never used, but if they ever switched it on, it wouldn't do much because it was moving 60 CFM. And that, that's with the, without the filter. And, and the reason was a crazy amount of ductwork. No one had ever measured it. So, so yeah, exactly. We, we need to make this not only user friendly, but user, you, you can't disturb the user with anything or they'll find a way to defeat it. If your ERV or HRV blows cold air on someone, you know what happens? They tape it over because they don't want cold air blowing on themselves. You do anything like that, people will work to make themselves comfortable. Like one of the things I think is that it's like, I feel like with like uh, infrared cameras used to be very, very expensive and then they became cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. And now you can get one for 300 bucks on your iPhone. I sort of feel like we're at that stage now where like once you, and then, and then people started to think like infrared cameras, like how you see for, look for thermal bridging. You start to like train your eyes to look for thermal bridges. I feel like we're at the beginning with CO2 monitors where people are just starting to think about this. I'm trying to think of ways you could give people simple instructions or some exercises on like how to do some monitoring. I think that might be interesting to sort of say like, if we're gonna, let's say we could, let's say we go to a couple of these suppliers and we say, hey, would you like to donate a dozen of these to the Cambridge Library and the Dorchester Library and the Newton Library and then pick them up and we'd have a little instructions on how to do monitoring and how to report it. It's like, 
how people do like, um, you know, informal bird or bird white sightings in the Boston Globe, right? Like, what are you seeing for levels? And like, to me, I'd be interested, like, yeah, what does public transportation look like? Uh, I brought mine in the car. I'm amazed if I don't turn on the ventilation system in my car, and I, like, I just sitting there, I'll be like, oh, I always thought I was getting drowsy because I was tired. It's actually the CO2 levels in your car when your ventilation system doesn't go on, will shoot up over very high, very quickly. With one, oh, is that right? I haven't yeah. done that yet. With I'll, one person, I'll, I'll yeah, I was really wondering why I got so drowsy in the car, and I was like, oh, it's probably because the CO2 levels were like 2,000 above 2,000. Really? So, like, every time. Oh, it's I a really work, small enclosure, right? Yeah, I mean, so it's worse just, than a room. It's like. A sixteenth of a room, right? Yeah, and then you think like every time I see four people in a car now and the windows closed, I think like, what are the CO two levels in there? But like, it would be interesting if we could get these donated libraries with some simple instructions. Yeah, and then so have I'd a like to riff on your idea. Yeah, here's your here's an idea for you. Hmm. You you got to make it attractive to somebody. So here's my idea: you go to a high school with an environmental sciences class, and you engage the teacher, and you say, look. You want some hands-on learning, and then you take your, you know, the uh, monitors from the library that you've got put in there, right? Mm -hmm. And and you give that to the teacher, and you let each of the students, you know, have it for like a, you know, a day or a week or something, and yeah. see what they all come uh, back I with. Think, and I think there's a lot of um, a lot of people who are trying to get their kids into good colleges. It's all about education and achievement. If you show them, if we said like, here's like the, what the Harvard School of Public Health shows for these studies of cognitive function and how your cognitive function declines as the CO2 levels rise and your critical thinking skills decline, it would be interesting to show that and then to monitor uh, schools. But I think if we if we did a thing with like Green Newton, for example, and they put it out in their newsletter and said, okay, there's a dozen sensors, please bring them into community spaces and tell like, I, I went to a a community meeting for a permitting hearing in Weston and there was 40 people in this tiny room yeah. And I was, only because we've been monitoring at the classroom, I was like, oh my God, I know why everyone's getting cranky and like yep. yawning, like they're tired. And there's like the CO2 levels are probably through the roof in here. So the more we can draw attention to it, then people say, oh, I, I don't want my kid to have bad air quality. I don't want to have bad air quality. We're trying to make town decisions, like communal decisions in these small spaces with bad, you know, so I think part of it is just like getting in the into spaces and then making a part of the conversation where it becomes sort of becomes normal like oh yeah we need to monitor this in any high occupancy space yep that, i i agree 100 percent. i mean there are so many things that uh, once you start looking at them you start pulling the thread you realize oh well you know there's this is a thing and we should really be doing something about it yeah well then maybe that'll be part of the project maybe for the next session we could see if anyone wants to volunteer to help us do outreach for uh, to to get some donations and then to get these into libraries and say, but like just like do volunteer data collection. Like if we had a form that said, what was the space? What did you record? You know, and then we could track it. We could create like our own like sort of very informal survey of CO two reporting. You know what I've done? I've done this for four classes uh, in Shrewsbury and Wayland. Um, just teachers that you know somehow my wife connected me with. That had either physics or environmental sci or you know something like that um, classes, and she said, "Oh, you should just talk to him about it." And I just came in. And I did like an hour presentation QA on Passive House, right? Get them while they're young, right? <laughs> and so um, the kids asked really good questions. You know, I mean, some of them are really pretty sharp, and, and uh, I am actually going to be um, managing an intern. Mass CEC intern this year. Uh, and I'm part, I think, you know, of the Heat Smart Alliance. We're trying to figure out how to get <laughs> heat pumps into a million homes in the next 10 years in Massachusetts. Nothing like an ambitious target. And so one of the things we need to do is an accurate load calculation, right? And if it's going to take somebody six or eight hours to do the calculation, it ain't going to happen. So we've got an intern from Berkeley that's Mass CEC funded. I'm going to work with him to improve on a spreadsheet that takes historical fuel use data and weather data and comes out with a building heating load. And we've got it working um, and we're going to improve on it with the intern and who knows where that's going to go. So, so this is all having to do with climate change, which I think is job number one. But as we start tightening up the buildings, right, this problem is going to get worse. This is my leaky five air change in our house, right? What happens in those houses that are built to code that are better than three air changes? Some of them may be two, 
Some of them, I'm, I'm working on some now, they're gonna be one air change an hour. Those houses have, the ones I'm working on, have ventilation going into the bedrooms. What about the ones that are using exhaust fans, right? What about the ones that are using recirculating cooktop hoods, right? I mean, it's, it's a wild west out there. Folks, we are at time. Um, so that might be a good ending point for tonight. Everything else, we can continue on with, with the next discussion because uh, there's so many directions this can go in. Um, I know I'm going to take this monitor in a car and, and see, <laughs> see what happens. I'm going to take mine on my bicycle and see what it's like outside uh, over Route 2. <laughs> uh, but we're, we'll reconvene and, and have another one of these series and keep the discussion going with other topics. Folks who have attended today, send in you know questions, things that you're concerned with, things you'd like to talk about as we keep this going. Um, and Aaron, can I send you this, this thing Paul wrote up? And I'll yeah. also ask, uh, I'll send it to them so people have time to think about it. What would you like to do next time in this series? Just any ideas you might have. And I'll, Aaron, I'll get that stuff to you in like a day or so. I'm, I'm flat out. I got another meeting at 730. So I want to get dinner <laughs> and, and get to it. <laughs> yeah. So no, yeah, we'll uh, give that to me. I'll send it out to everyone who is registered for this. We might be able to post it on the website next to where the video of this goes as well. So folks can see it. Um, anybody who wants to reply to that email with, you know, your ideas for what you want to talk about next time, please do. Fantastic. Um, that'll be it. Thank you all for being here. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank, Thank you, Nick. Bye. Thank you, Aaron. Bye.